Special welcome to all of our preschool families. It's a pleasure to have you with us. It's always a good day to have the kids amongst us uh, singing and sharing uh, as we worship the Lord. Uh, so I welcome you especially. I'm glad to see you also survive the winds and the rains and the, the great uh, tri tribulation that we went through this uh, the, just yesterday, the other day. I guess two days ago already. Losing track, you know. When you lose your power, you sort of lose track of time. So anyway, it's good to be with you in the Lord's house. We welcome you that are tuning in online. Welcome to Grace. Uh, it's a privilege to be with you in the Lord's house. Today we're going to be looking at the gospel lesson, uh, John 3.16, and we're going to be challenging ourselves a little bit to go a little deeper than maybe we normally would when we look at that passage, challenge ourselves to see the depths of that passage. So that's what we're going to be doing a little bit. Uh, and as, uh, as we continue today, let's begin with a word of, a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your gospel promise in Jesus' cross and resurrection. May we leave this place better than we came, more secure in our faith, shaped by the transformational waters of our baptism and the gift of your Holy Spirit. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. As we begin this morning, we do so with our first song, uh, I am, uh, uh, Just As I Am, I Come Broken. Let us rise and lift our voices to the Lord.
And so now we make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your presence and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake he forgives us all of our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them his Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me do the intro at first. Get ahead of myself. The intro for today is from Psalm 105. And it says... He remembers his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations. Seek the Lord and his strength. Remember the wondrous works that he has done. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, he is the Lord our God. Glory be to the Father and to the Son. As it was in the beginning. Amen. And now to the Kyrie. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world. For the well-being of the church of God. And for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. And so the Lord be with you. you. Let us pray together the collect of the day as you see it there before you. And so we pray together. O God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And so now it is my absolute privilege to invite our little ones to come forward and share with us their music today.
awesome. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for singing so well. Let's play let's, one more time. <laughs> Nicely done. Well done, guys. Very, very much. Now, a little invitation. Do you think we, at the last song, Jesus Loves Me? Oh, oh. Is it possible? Yes, to come at the end. At the end, at the yes. very end of the service, last song together. Yes. So can you help us with that last song later on? Yes. It'll be okay? Okay, good. Very good. So we're going to send them off to the fellowship hall for now, and they're going to have a little children's church while we go through the Bible and, and uh, spend a little time in the Word, and then they'll be back at the offering, okay? So guys, thank you so much. Absolutely. Yes. And moms, if you need to go, you can go as well. That's okay. Good job, man. Well done. Well, for all the big kids that are still left, we're going to turn to the Word of God now for the second Sunday in Lent. The Old Testament lesson for today is taken from Genesis, the 12th chapter, beginning with the first verse. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. And they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and I on the right. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. This is the word of our Lord. The epistle lesson for today is taken from the book of Romans, the fourth chapter, beginning with the eighth or the first verse. What, what then shall we say that Abraham our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter. If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited, credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the ones who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work but trust God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, 
but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless. Because the law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. This is the word of our Lord. It is our privilege at this point now to hear from the choir. They're going to share with us the song, God to Love the World. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. The Holy Gospel is according to St. John, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could do the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless he is born again. 
How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he can't enter into his mother's womb a second time to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh and spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound, but you don't know where it's coming from. Word is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, and you do not understand these things, Jesus said. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not, un- do not believe our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one, no one goes into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the, in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that who, who, everyone who believes in him would have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only Son, so that whoever should believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for your gospel message. We thank you for John 3.16 and its deep meaning, that you and I would be called children of God because of your gifts, because you've come to us, because you save us. Lord, help us to greater, have a greater appreciation of that gospel lesson and help us, Lord, to have ears to hear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we gather today, again, I want to welcome you. I'm very glad to see all the folks from our preschool families. Glad to, that you're with us today. We're spending some time in a very familiar place for, uh, for, for many people, John 3.16, John chapter 3. But before we go there, I want, to, I want to go back a ways in the timeline of things to, I think it's 1989 or 90, a book came out by the name of, of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Ever heard of this one? It's been out there a long time. And in this, they had, he has a discussion of a time when he was on a subway train, and everybody, he describes, you know, it was kind of a peaceful ride uh, to wherever he was going. And people are reading newspapers, some were kind of napping, some were just sort of taking it all in. And then they made a stop where a, a man and his children got on, I think there were three children, and the children were pretty wily. <laughs> they were running around slapping newspapers and being goofy and, and running up and down the aisles and being loud. And, and the man, he came in, he sat down next to Stephen Covey and he was sort of just staring into space looking at the floor. And uh, he, says, he said, I thought to myself, you really should do something about these children. So I spoke to the guy and said, you really should do something about these children. Of course, I'm paraphrasing a lot of this. And the guy says, yeah, I, th- I think you're right. I just don't know what to say to them. You see, their mother just passed away an hour ago. <sighs> yeah, the, the moon, the, wow, you know, that's a shocker. But he said, I learned a lot about perspective that day. Because what I assumed was going on was nothing of the sort. I thought I knew what I could see and know, but I didn't know enough, right? And as we come into John chapter 3, especially verse 16, we can quote it, baby by heart. We, we've memorized it, perhaps. But do we really understand it? Do we, is it the most understood thing in our lives? And when we look at it, I want to I challenge you. My goal is to challenge you a little bit to see if we can go a little deeper with it than we might see in a sign or just casually looking at it. To take it to the heart of where it's meant to take us, a place that would change us, literally bring us into that holy fellowship that is with Jesus, the Messiah. And so we come to it today. Let's, let's talk about the context of things. Uh, Jesus takes a professor of theology to school. Nicodemus comes to him in the dark. Now, he comes to him without a sense of knowledge. He really doesn't fully understand who he's talking to. And so we want to kind of sideline here this idea of knowledge. There's a, we're going to move in a process from where Nicodemus was to where he eventually ends up. And you'll see in that process that he is moving from, from not understanding, no, really a lack of faith, 
uh, to a place where he's absolutely believing in the Lord's Savior. And that's a process of knowledge, acceptance, and trust. And we see in this passage in John chapter 3 that his knowledge is incomplete. Now, he's a Pharisee, which means that he lives in a world where there's a lot of do's and don'ts. There are a lot of things that uh, you that are very carefully orchestrated and followed. We hear that throughout the Gospels, how to wash your hands and so on. And uh, the Pharisees often saw themselves as referees of these things, gatekeepers of heaven. So it's interesting to say that Jesus would come to him and and immediately start off with, no one goes to heaven unless they are born of water and the Spirit, born again. In other words, you're not going to get there on your own. Your knowledge is, is incomplete. Your knowledge is insufficient. Not only that, but we see him talk to Jesus as rabbi and teacher and miracle worker, but he doesn't understand him as Savior or Messiah yet. And so they're watching all these things. The pieces are there, but he's not putting them all together. And what he doesn't understand is this law, flesh gives birth to flesh. The flesh is already ruined. It's sinful. It can't possibly aspire to heaven. You, you know, folks, we don't go to heaven. We are brought to heaven by virtue of God's grace. And this is something he doesn't understand yet. And so as we, as we look at this text, he's, he's trying to grasp what's going on. He doesn't understand. And Jesus kept, you're Israel's teacher and you don't get it? That's kind of interesting. You know, I've talked to you about earthly things you don't believe. What, how are you going to believe if I talk about the big stuff? And so he goes on. And what he's talking about is a complete redo. You've got to have a spirit giving birth, a spirit thing. In other words, think of it as a house that has termites, utterly eaten out and completely destroyed. Throwing a coat of paint on that is not going to fix it. Would you agree? Okay. It takes nothing short of replacing every, every scrap of wood, everything that's been ruined by the termite. You've got to start over with something new. The, the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Something new is going on that's applied and given through faith, through the grace that God is providing. Now, there's something else at play with Nicodemus that is still kind of getting in his way uh, to totally uh, understanding who Jesus is, and that's he's sitting on the fence. Now, when we say we're sitting on the fence, we know what that means. He can't make up his mind who this guy is. And so what happens is, you know, he's got a lot of risk. You know, I've got a good career. I'm a Pharisee. I I work in the top office of Israel. Do I really want to risk those things uh, and toss them aside? So I'm going to sit on the fence and I'm going to investigate and try and have it both ways. You know who did that the best? That was Pilate. Pilate sat on the fence. He knew Jesus was innocent, but he didn't want to be responsible for crucifying and kept trying to get out of it, trying to have it both ways. You get, first thing he does is he tries to send him off to Herod. Herod sends him back. Next thing, he tries to release uh, a prisoner, but he lets Barabbas go. The mob wants Barabbas instead of Jesus. And then he, and then he uh, tries to, the, 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 the sympathy card, has Jesus beaten to a pulp. Behold the man. Very famous scene. That doesn't work. No, they scream for his, his uh, crucifixion, so ultimately he washes his hands proclaiming his own innocence, but he's not innocent. You can't sit on the fence. The fence, one of the things we learn very quickly is the fence is where cowards are. You can't, you can't just sit there. It's not going to work. People don't respect that besides. Not only that, but you've got to take a stand somewhere. Three, John 3.16 will not allow you to sit on the fence with who Jesus is. And so... He's drawing Nicodemus into this conversation to see who he is, to introduce him to things. And he uses, obviously uses uh, things that he understands from the Old Testament. One of the things Pharisees did is they memorized huge portions of the Old Testament. So Numbers 21, where Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, is very familiar to him. And in this way, this is how God loved the world. And so it begins to settle in for him, but he still doesn't seem to get it. But to be born again, ultimately, folks is where John 3.16 is meant to take us, to bring us into that full relationship with Jesus, to fully see every bit of what the gospel means. So let's carry forward. Let's go into this next stage, acceptance. Well, acceptance is hard. It's okay to know something, but to take it in and make it a part of your world, to, 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 to make it a part of your life, that's a whole different level. Jesus uses something familiar now to teach something essential. And, and along these lines, I want to I kind of sidestep to, a, to um, a fellow by the name of Dr. Jordan Peterson. Anybody heard of him? Okay. He's a very controversial figure in the minds of many people. 
But not too long ago, he had a, an interesting conversation about the cross with a fellow by the name of Joe Rogan on the Joe Rogan Experience a few years ago. And he talks about this. Now, I want you to understand that, that uh, Peterson is heavily influenced by philosophy, and he, he's lived in the world of psychology and that, that kind of thing for 30 years. That's been his life. And there's a lot of talk about him coming to the faith of Jesus. And when he talks about the cross and Joe Rogan, he takes us back properly to Numbers chapter 21 with um, the, the serpent on the pole. Now, a little context, the people of Israel were complaining as they did. Oh, we hate it, it's hot, don't like the food, etc. You just brought us out here to die, and so on. And so the Lord sent snakes among the people, and the snakes bite people, and many of them die. Side note, by the way, the snakes, they believed that they were about two to three foot long called saw scale vipers. So the scales, they rub their, their scales together and make a noise, you know. But they were small enough to get into your, your hamper and into your bed sheets and all the other stuff. You know, it kind of makes my skin crawl just thinking about it. So they would surprise people all they were in everything. And they're, they're all over the camp. And so they go to, to go to Moses and say, go talk to God. Have something done about this. Please do something. And this is where Peterson speaks up. He says, what comes next is kind of weird. He says, you know, you would think God would take away the snakes, but that's not what he does. Instead, he says, no, uh, create uh, a serpent on a pole made out of bronze, put it on a pole for everyone to see and attach a promise to it. And when the snakes bite you, you will live. Well, the interesting thing is what he brings up. He says, in the world of psychiatry, one of the doctrines of psychiatry is those that are uh, consumed with fear the idea to overcome that is that you, you would voluntarily face your fears and expose yourself to it more and more. In other words, you'll become braver because of it. And from his perspective, of course, his background is heavily influencing this, he says God wants them braver, not necessarily safe. And that's kind of an interesting concept. That one, that grabs my attention, right? Uh, because the world is not a safe place. We can all agree it's not a happy place sometimes. So it's more important to have courage than it is to be safe all the time. I agree with that. But that's not the full picture. He goes into the cross next, and he says, okay, he brings it across. Now he looks at the cross in the same manner. The manner of the cross, he says, look at the cross. It's everything. It's the aggregation of everything that people fear, are afraid of. And you have the, the, uh, uh, the cross itself, this horrifying, terrible, painful death. And then you have the fact that his, one of his own betrayed him. And then he had his friends abandon him. Then he had the, the mob, his own people turn against him. And he had an unfair trial. And then he was convicted. We know he was innocent. And, and he was young. And he, he did all kinds of good. He, all this stuff. The one that grabs my attention on his list is, is Mother Mary. Her mother, a parent, as a parent, I can't imagine seeing my child sacrificed like that the ultimate fear of a parent. And so he goes through all these fears that are associated with it, and it's the aggregation, it's the ultimate fear. And, and, and then he talks about that some more. And he says, that's who we are. We are the mob, we are the, uh, we are the mom. We're meant to stand in those shoes. But I, wanna, I want you to understand when he talks about it, he sort of falls short in this. It's because the cross is not about making us brave. Not just that. The cross that... Jesus died on is meant to transform us. It's meant to do more than that. And so we can mingle some of these ideas in, but that's, that's not a whole picture. That's one of the things that, that uh, Nicodemus was. He was mingling all this old, old thinking, and Jesus was trying to clear away that so it was pure gospel. So if we look at this, we also want to note that John 3.16 is not just about love either. God so loved the world. We, we love quoting that. We love the love aspect of that. Who doesn't? But it's not so much the love. It's, if you look at it carefully, you'd see the translation in English is really poorly written, no matter what kind of Bible you use, King James or otherwise. Because if you translate it, and I'm not going to get into all the Greek, but for, you know, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. If you translate John 3.16, it should say, in this way, this is how God loved the world. This is how God loved the world. He put him on the cross. And so it's not so much that God loved us. And of course, he does. Isn't that the good stuff? But it's how 
he does. Now, his desire is not only to love you and save you, but his desire is to have you entirely in his kingdom. And that takes us to the depth of John 3.16. It's not about courage or bravery or love by itself. Those things are incomplete without the rest of this picture. And so he wants us to accept that. He wants us to be brought into that, to be changed by that. And then you notice what it says, in him, that's a powerful thing. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son so that in him we may have eternal life. There's a gift there. Any parent like giving these little ones gifts up here? Anybody does that? Yeah. We spoil our grandkids, some of us. I got my first one. I'm, I'm working at it. <laughs> right? Why do we give our gifts to those people? Because we love, the, we love them like crazy. And we know that's the nature. And we want to give them the best that we can. And we want, it's not just the stuff, but it's ourselves. And everything possible that is worthwhile, we want them to have. And that's the way God's heart is too, right? So in him, he gives Jesus so that we might have uh, the opportunity to know him and then have the package deal, everything that goes with Jesus. We know him then as savior, not just as a rabbi or some philosopher. That's where the acceptance takes us. And the beautiful part is it transforms us. It's transfiguring, if you will, to have that connection to Jesus. So where does that take us? If we move from knowledge to acceptance, the last one is trust. So how do we know if we're reborn? Well, the answer is in Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a very different guy the next time we see him. At, well, at the end of um, when Jesus is crucified. And we know that in John, we see it in John chapter 19, he and, and Joseph of Arimathea, they go up to Pilate and they say, can we have the body? Now, these are two very, very rich, well-to-do guys. You got to understand they wear robes a lot nicer than mine. They had Armani kind of stuff, the high-end stuff, you know, right? The stuff you want to keep clean and you don't want to tear, they didn't care. Not only that, but when they went out to take care of Jesus' body, it disqualified them from, being, from doing their job because they now become unclean in the sense that uh, you, you can't participate in worship now. That doesn't matter anymore. We know that they've changed because they focus just on Jesus. They don't even think about themselves anymore. And so they go up to Jesus and they, they, they get his dead body down from the cross. Now, what did they just witness? They just witnessed this man lifted up like the snake in the desert. We've seen this man kneel to the cross. We've listened to his, his cries. We've heard the sounds of the air, the gurgles, the, the fluid air that he's struggled with to breathe. We've, we see his body, body utterly destruction, bleeding, bruised, a mess. And they bring these guys, bring him down, and these guys are now getting covered with Jesus' dirt, sweat, and blood all over these clothes. They don't care anymore. And we, they dress him up, they clean him, they do the ritual things, they clean up his body, they personally take care of him, all while his colleagues are probably watching. The guys that condemned him, they don't care anymore. See the freedom in it? And so they take care of Jesus, and they wrap his head, and they wrap his body in the strips of linen, and then they put the cloth over him, and they put him in a tomb that is brand new, belongs to the family of Joseph, Nobody's been in it before, but now he's my family. I'm going to treat him as one of ours. That's the least I can do for this man. And so in worship, almost in a worship format, they put him in there, and they put the 75 pounds of spices. That's a lot of smell, believe me. But it's a king's funeral. And then that's it. Now, what to understand is that now they've come to the same understanding as the disciples who are hiding, by the way. They're not out there. They don't have that courage yet. But it's still an unfinished picture, isn't it? What happens three days later, folks? The tomb is empty. Can you imagine, can you imagine the conversation that Nicodemus and Joseph must have had with a resurrected Jesus later on? How cool that would be. Ah, now you understand. Now you see, Nicodemus. I'd like to imagine that conversation happening. It did appear to at least 500 people we know at one time. Was Nicodemus and Joseph in that crowd? I'd like to think so. But what a beautiful, beautiful thing to think. Ah, now I finally see it all. 
but to have that level of trust, to have that level of, of faith in the Lord. You know, let's put it this way. These guys were no longer afraid of snakes or being bit. And for us, the same thing can be said. When you're standing at the empty tomb, the snakes don't mean much anymore. There's nothing to be afraid of. And so we see a change not only in these two men, but we see also a change in the disciples later on. And that's why we're here today. Because there is more to John 3.16 than just the memorization of it. It has a future for us. And so we bring it to this. I want to, let's do this together. Let's, let's say this together. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever should believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We know this verse. But folks, did you ever wonder why Jesus or the Lord didn't take away the snakes? Because putting a serpent on a pole brought his people to him. Ever wonder why Paul's thorn wasn't just simply removed from him, that God's grace had to be sufficient? Because it brought Paul closer to the Lord, into a relationship that was deeper. Do you ever wonder why God doesn't just take away all the darkness of the world in one big swoop? Well, in a sense, he has with the cross. But ultimately, that cross is there to draw us unto himself. It's about building that relationship with you and I. Because, folks, where Jesus goes, we go. And you see, that's the true blessing that comes from John 3.16 and knowing what it really means. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. Let us rise. And now may the peace of God, which goes beyond all of our human understanding, guard and keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting, amen. Let us confess our faith now using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, many of us know John 3.16 by heart. This is good, but remind us that it goes much deeper than knowing it by heart. Move us to give thanks for how you loved us that you were lifted up on that cross as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert. May your cross draw us to you, and may we never take your grace for granted. Help us to know, accept, and trust in what John 3.16 truly means, and may we be people who are reborn in your Holy Spirit. Transform us as you did Nicodemus, from only being an expert merely in worldly things, into a believer of courage who stands in the resurrection, unafraid of the snakes of this world. We pray, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for those who mourn this day. and pray for Pastor Alan Scott and his family as they mourn the death of his wife, Corey. And we pray also for Bob Heakey and his family as they mourn the loss of his brother, David. We pray for the Lehman family as they mourn the passing of Charles as well. Lord, we pray for all who mourn. May the good news of your gospel message mercifully uplift and strengthen all of them. May the resurrection instill a hope that would propel them towards a joy in the Lord who promises eternal life. Refresh their spirits and wisdom of your word and give them that promise and that hope. We pray, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, we also pray for renewal of body and soul for those who need your help. We pray for Bev Morris and for Kathy Hayes. We pray for Catherine Vogt and for Denise Coots and Pat Franklin, for Greg Gatsos and Paul Dean, Marie Timberlake and Mary Weiser, Donata Owsley and Amy Razor, uh, Art Payne, George Williams, Bob Berber, and John and Teresa Dunlap, for Janet Keener and Harry Ross, Kennedy Donnelly and Mark Deerdorf, Diana Warren, Kathy Rice and Jim Ferber, Sean McGee, Amy Donahue and Hank Rausch, for Sandra Foster and for Marianne Blank, Sean McNamara and Dottie Krauss, Jim Potter, Stephen Corner, Sally Stith and Dan Dekoff. We pray for these as well as those known only to you. Father, bless each one with your grace to heal, to receive peace, to be uplifted in the spirit, 
and to believe so strongly that they may be steadfast in Jesus in spite of it all. We pray, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, we give thanks for this country and for the incredible lives we lead here. Fill our hearts with gratitude. With all that is broken in our culture, make us and do with those, those people who would do what is good. Make us as citizens to be examples of godliness, peace, and unity. Protect and guard our, our service people from here at home as they work on our behalf, defending us from danger. For Ellen, uh, Lana Warren and Matt McClellan, Kyle Sears and Ben Meredith, Joseph Berturka and Roy Schaefer, for Jessica Christensen and, and Stephen Hoagland, Lucas Faith, Jacob Strive, Michael and Thomas Kendall, Megan Fitzpatrick King, Lauren Mitchell and Carter Whitaker and Jerry Boyd. Give them endurance, strength, and wisdom to do their duties well. Give to them your grace to believe and sustain them in their faith. We pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for the opportunities we have. We thank you for Sugar Bush and for the beautiful weather. We thank you that the effects of the storm have, for the most part, been minor, and we are glad that no one has gotten hurt. And on this special day, we especially thank you for our preschool friends, big and little, and we are glad that we may walk together in a way that would bless us as children of God. May the parents and family members find joy in this time together, and may they be equipped and with wisdom and opportunity to bless their children on this day and in the days ahead by your word and your example. And as God's people now, give us opportunity now to answer the call of our Savior, an opportunity to connect with people in their everyday lives. Give us wisdom to advance the gospel through God's word and fellowship and stir our hearts to lend ourselves in service that we may become instruments that lead others to salvation. We pray, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, we lift up all for whom we pray now, trusting in your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who himself has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. At this point in our service, we have the opportunity to bring our offerings forward, but we also have an opportunity as God's children to raise our voices and praise God for his gifts, which is also an offering. So let us raise our voices as we sing, I love you, Lord. now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and forever and always give you his peace in Jesus. Amen. Can you say amen? amen. Outstanding. So can you help us with our last song? We're going to say Jesus loves me. We got two verses here and you can help us on the second one. I know they know the first one really good. So uh, we're going to sing real loud. Okay.
you so much, guys, for all of your help on our last song. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll go ahead and have you go back to your moms and dads, and I'll tell everybody the announcements while you're doing that, okay? Very good. Good job. Well, as we round things out for the day, there are some things that we want to make you aware of uh, for the week ahead. First thing we want to say is thank you for joining us today again, for being with us, uh, all of our preschool parents. Sorry about that. <laughs> and uh, thank you for allowing us to share together today in the Lord's house. Um, also want to thank those who worked at Sugarbush, our, con our uh, congregation. Uh, today's the last day, and thank you for all the work that you've done out there. Some things that are coming up this week to make you aware. Uh, we have uh, Wednesday night, we continue with our, our uh, Red Letter Challenge. This week we're on forgiving, and we're going to be looking at that. Also Thursday, uh, beginning at 2 o'clock, hope you're all swollen up and ready to pop, because we have our uh, blood drive coming up on Thursday. It runs from 2 o'clock to 6 o'clock. And it's really helpful if you go online and make an appointment and get that out of the way. It really expedites the process if you can do that. Uh, other things that are coming down the pike, uh, we have uh, lilies. If you want to sponsor an Easter lily, you can do that by signing up at the office out there. LWML, your retreats on April 14th and 15th. Just want to keep you mindful that that's coming up fast. Uh, also, St. Patrick's Party is next Saturday from 6.30 to 8.30. And then afterwards, as I understand it, you can turn your clock ahead just for fun. <laughs> so that's coming up as well. Uh, we also have a drive-in communion that's coming up for those the shut-ins, you guys tuning in online, who haven't had the chance to have communion in a while. You've worshipped online. But this is an opportunity for you to, to come and get that communion on the 19th at 1 o'clock. So we invite you to that as well. And then Easter weekend, for everybody here, I just want to share with you, if you don't have plans, uh, we have uh, Easter services Monday, Thursday, Good Friday at 7 o'clock. On Easter Sunday, we have services at 6.30 sunrise, 8 o'clock, and 10.30, all with communion. And so we celebrate real big, which also means for our people, we don't have Saturday night service that weekend. We have other opportunities. So anyway, Pastor Kishnick will be back uh, later on today. We'll find out what kind of day it was out there at Sugarbush later, but thank God for a beautiful day and for the beautiful, beautiful opportunity to be with you guys. We appreciate it very much. The Lord be with you, and we'll, we'll greet you out in front.